Welcome to the HPC Best Practices uh, webinar series. Uh, the series is brought to you by the Ideas Productivity Project, uh, which is funded by the XA Scale Computing Project. It's a collaboration with the U.S. Department of Energy Computing Facilities at the Argonne, Oak Ridge, and Lawrence Berkeley, Berkeley National Laboratories. I'm Osni Marcus from Lawrence Berkeley. Ashley Barker from Oak Ridge and I will be the hostess, hosts for today's webinar, Software Management Plans and Research Projects. The webinar will be presented by Shoaib Ahmed Sufi from the Software Sustainability Institute in the United Kingdom. Shoaib leads the Software Sustainability Institute's community engagement activities and strategies. He graduated in computer science from the University of Manchester in 1997, and he has worked in the commercial sector as a system programmer and as a software developer as well. He has a specific interest in building, managing, and sustaining high-performance teams distributed agile, uh, agile project management and the promotion of technical best practice in software product, products for using research. He coordinates the Institute's fellowship program, a network of researchers who act as ambassadors of better research software practice to their domains and organizations. As Ashley uh, mentioned, all attendees have been muted and we'll be receiving questions through the WebEx chat and also the Google Doc. We have pasted this address in the chat of WebEx. The webinar will have breaks, so Shweb can respond to the questions that come in. Uh, thank you for joining us. With that, Shweb, please, uh, Ashley, we'll give him uh, sharing. Good introduction. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll begin. Okay, welcome everyone. Thanks for uh, making it for the Software Management Plans and Research software webinar. My name is Shwev Sufi. As, as introduced, I'm the community lead at the UK Software Sustainability Institute. A little bit about the Institute first, as a way of background. Uh, so the, the Institute is a national facility for cultivating world-class software. Uh, work across research through better software. So better software, better research is our motto. So we believe that software code processes and community reach boundaries in their development and that prevents the adoption and, and growth. So as an institute we provide expertise and services uh, and programs that help people negotiate to the next stage. Uh, we support the broader community developing and using research software. We advocate for all things research software. Indeed, there is a T-shirt if, if you want to check that link. So how are we um, organized? We're organized in terms of teams. So we have a software team uh, and uh, we have a policy team uh, which are involved in looking at research software policy uh, and answering some of the questions like, for example, how much do people rely on software? We have an outreach team where we uh, run a very um, popular website, uh, www.software.ac.uk, which has 20,000 unique visitors per month. We have 6,500 followers on Twitter. We also have been involved in training of the international um, software carpentry movement. We're the UK uh, coordinators for that. Uh, we've run many, many workshops. Uh, and we also train instructors. Uh, in terms of the community side, which I have more of an oversight on, we have been running the fellowship program since 2012, so we've had 129 fellows till now, and we've run uh, many workshops in different areas of um, software, software, um, software and IP, software vi um, visualization tools, um, credit for software, and other topical issues. One of the, um, from our policy unit, one of the important uh, outputs was the, uh, you can see the bitly link there was a 7 out of 10 when we uh, did a kind of survey to see that 7 out of 10 researchers um, said that their research would be impossible without software. It was highlighting to our funders the importance of, uh, of software in research. Okay, on to uh, types of management plan. There's um, the data management plan. Uh, and data management plans is, in, in essence, where it all began, um, asking people to state how they will manage the data produced on their project. Later on came the idea of a software management plan, 
um, how you'll manage and produce the software that's produced on your project. And um, a term that you'll see appearing in the uh, presentation is output management plan. Uh, and this is how a combined management plan showing how data, software, and other resources um, produced on your software will be managed. Okay, the idea of um, managing software outcomes isn't new. Um, in 1976, there was this Defense Systems Software Management Plan, uh, and it really covered the importance and costs of, uh, of software, how software was acquired, how it was developed, and how it was maintained. Another example is the Advanced Composition Explorer project in 1994, and this, their software management plan uh, really was a contract uh, and quality assurance responsibilities and scope between the different partners um, developing the uh, ACE um, experiment, which was going to look at the uh, solar corona, amongst other things. So the idea of software management plans is not necessarily new, but also just because you join those words together doesn't necessarily mean that people mean the same thing. So what do, mean, so what do we mean then when we mention software management plans? When we mention software management plans, it means a statement of intent around how you manage your research software. That's, um, so why do we need it? In the normal research process, it can squeeze out time uh, for thinking about the proper management of software. Um, you're spending time building collaborations, you're spending time writing papers, you're spending time writing proposals, you're in meetings, you're at conferences, and software can really be squeezed out. So what does, it, what does uh, a software management plan um, contain? Well, um, it describes what, software, what your software does, what problem it hopes to solve, who the software is for, even if it's just for yourself, how, you, how you'll make your software available, how it will help you and others, how will you assess how it's helped you and others, the level of support you're willing to offer, how the software fits into the broader ecosystem of software in the problem space, e.g., what does it add, and how you'll intend to make your software available beyond the life of the project. These are some of the higher level goals um, of, of software management plans. So the Software Sustainability Institute um, generated uh, a, gui a guidance document on software management plans. Now this guidance document covers um, the reason why you need software management plans and also a checklist in terms of a series of questions um, and things that you want to think about for those particular questions and also uh, some, further, some further links and further information to help you frame your um, management plan in the best way. There are some caveats of course, not all questions are relevant for all projects and it depends on the nature of research software that you're producing and it also depends on your state of development. So the checklist for a software management plan is available here uh, in Zenodo, and I believe you all have a copy of the slide, so before now or after you can take a look. So what are some of, what are some of, the, what are the checklist questions? This was at, the number of checklist questions was actually reduced after a review. Um, I think there was 20 plus uh, checklist questions that originally and it came out that there were just too many and people wouldn't answer them. So this is what this has kind of gone through an iteration um, and so this is what we have. What software will you develop? Some of the things that people might want to consider when asking answering this particular question is, is it a greenfield site? Are you developing add-ons to some existing system or is it a new system or software that you're developing? What about the legal aspects, you know, the name, the name of, of the software that you're using, you know, is, is worth checking with other people. There are the name clashes. Who are the intended users of your software? You know, what's their skill level? Are you um, including developers here to help uh, build extension modules and, um, uh, interfa and other interfaces? How you make your software available to users? Have you thought about licensing? Will it be uh, you know, Apache or MIT, will it be, uh, will you go down the GPL route? How will you make it available as a package? Will you make it available for Linux, Windows, will you use containers? How will you, how will you support those who use your software? And this is really an important question in terms of setting expectations. 
because not everyone wants to produce another a source of uh, support, but for other people that's a source of empowerment, a way that they can build collaborations. How will you collect issues? Will there be a forum where people can discuss your software? How will your software contribute to research? Is it adding something new? Is it doing something quicker? Is it, is it more accurate? Is it easier? How will your software relate to other research objects? Um, how, how is it connected to other things, that other pieces of software and, and data and projects um, that exist um, in this space and papers, of course? Um, this links into the idea of fair digital objects um, and also uh, a kind of a machine representation of fair digital objects called research objects. Which you can see at that link, researchobject.org. Also, how will you measure your software's contribution to research? You know, will you measure, will you be, will you have a citation mechanism, maybe built in, maybe through a software paper? You know, will you be doing surveys uh, of users? Will you be collecting users? Of course, one has to remember privacy in the situation. And where will you deposit your software to guarantee its long-term availability? You know, will you be putting it in a digital re repository? That gives you an identifier and has made some commitments to longevity. Um, GitHub certainly is uh, an interesting place to put software, um, an excellent place with lots of features, but in terms of a committed digital repository, one might think something like Zenodo uh, would be quite useful, which is hosted at CERN. And so there's GitHub Zenodo integration, which is, uh, uh, which is useful to know about. Okay, I'm going to pause there for. Any questions at the moment? Yes, Shweb, there is one question here. In a research institute, what other people should control or, or, or modify the, the SMP document? Your supervisor, other parties? Is there any reason not to include it with the source code? Um, I will talk a, bit, a little bit more about the life cycle of when these things are produced um, shortly. Um, in terms of um, adding it with the source code, um, uh, the software management plan is um, is a plan. Um, it's, uh, you, it's a statement about what you will what you will do. Um, whereas I think software where source code might be more about what you have done, so it should be a manifestation of the plan. I see no harm in adding it to source code repository, saying this is what we say we will do. And uh, then people can see for themselves uh, whether you did what you said you would do. But other people might want more flexibility and, and manage, manage that document separately. OK, thank you. Please continue. OK. So when to write one? So normally, one would write one at the start of a project. Actually, not even at the start of the project. At the start, when you're trying to acquire funding, even. When you're um, so in some UK calls, um, funding calls, uh, EPSRC, which is um, one of the well, one of the a funder in the UK, uh, a government funding source in the UK. Uh, in 2017, the High End Computing Consortia grant, and also the Computational Science and Engineering Software for the Future call in 2014, um, made it mandated using using software management plans. Or, but they were, they were submitted as part of a document called Pathways to Impact. So this is a set of documents. It, you know, it's primarily for detailing the activities that will increase the likelihood of potential economic and societal impacts being achieved. So this is quite a broad, uh, quite a broad definition. This is the first kind of foray into using software management plans. The other idea of when to when to when to write one is if you don't have one, you might want to run one during a running project. For example, if you not made one at the beginning, it might be a useful useful way uh, as a review or audit of software assets. Once you know, uh, once known, you know, once you know which software assets you have, you could decide as um, a program of activity or project of activity to take a more consistent approach. For example, rather than different modules being in in researchers' personal GitHub repositories, using a GitHub organization, um, having consistent documentation, whether you want to use GitHub's wiki or 
um, read the docs or, or some other system, um, your book, for example, uh, and what licenses you use, it might actually surface the idea of which licenses you, you want to use or license you want to use. And also, an important one, it's not just about the source code, it's also a consistent approach towards credit. You know, who's, who is, well, how will we get, how will different people get credit for, for contributing? Software management plans are meant to be living documents. So the first one, very much like a project management plan, uh, or any project plan, is a baseline. Um, they should be visited maybe every three to six months or annually. You should version them. Uh, the project lead, the person in charge of project, will ultimately be responsible for making sure that they are implemented and used. Um, used. And software evaluation uh, can help here. Okay, what do we mean by software evaluation? So software management plans are an intention around what you plan to do. All the questions at the, that you saw from the software guidance is really about what do you plan to do. Um, but software evaluation is different. Software evaluation is about what you are doing, very much in a in a in a in the same way as a quality management system. What you're what you think you're doing versus what you are doing. And software evaluation can just help when you're delivering your software management plan and adjusting it where necessary, looking at various aspects, such as assessing code quality, um, usability, and the overall sustainability. For example, documentation, licensing. Repositories. Okay, so there are certain different software evaluation approaches, and these different software evaluation approaches are at different levels of relevance to um, uh, software management plans. You have um, the criteria based approach, and this is very much quantitative assessment in terms of various kind of higher order facets around sustainability, maintainability, and usability, where you, you look at how it's, you know, how you're building it, how you're installing it, what's the testing, what's the documentation, what's your support, how portable is it, do you have a contributor policy, copyright licenses, and these, um, uh, these aspects can really help inform higher level decisions on specific areas for software improvement. It's also the basis for online sustainability evaluation, which you can get to there and run through a piece of software that you may have or may look after. And if you don't have a software management plan, the OES can be a great way to bootstrap one. It can show you, it can highlight things that you're doing, which you don't really think about, you just do. And it can also highlight gaps, areas which you want to um, think about and areas which you want to build upon. Another type of software evaluation approach is the, is the tutorial based approach. In the tutorial based approach, um, you have a subjective view uh, based on the different personas that use your software. For example, a user, a developer, or a deployer of your software. How are they learning the software? How are they building or installing or configuring or whatever is relevant? The outcome here can be a practical guide for getting the software to work in the way it should. So this is more a tutorial-based approach leads to information which is more useful from a quality perspective rather than a planning perspective. In either case, you need to, you know, you know, you need to use a judgment about what to include based on the type of software, the environment, e.g. is it open development, and personas of those um, doing the assessment, do they match? the different roles that people use the software. A quite a, a recent, as in last week, um, released by the Chaos Community Health Analytics Open Source Software Project, which is a project taking part under the auspices of the Linux Foundation, which is I are participating via then director Neil Chu Hong, is um, another way you could assess your software Potentially, these are more suited to larger pieces of software, which already started to have a community. And for them, their metrics are grouped um, into a group, their working groups with focus areas. For example, common metrics, organization affiliation, diversity and inclusion, like diversity, governance, leadership. These include uh, things to do with events around the software, evolution, 
um, is a working group around code development. Uh, but code development here includes things like um, code changes, code changes over time, um, the ways in the ways in which um, pull requests or people who want to contribute to the software, how how efficiently that is um, taken on board. There's risk. Uh, business risk, code quality, licensing, transparency, value, labor, investment, living wage. Uh, in terms of, you know, that's an interesting one. Too, if people work on a piece of software, would they be able to get a job using that software? You can see that there's a slightly different focus here than, than research software, but there are some interesting ideas that one could apply to maybe if you have a more long-running or established piece of software and you'd like to open this piece of software up to more contributions from a wider community or a larger consortium. Of course, this can then feed back into how you'd like to phrase. And this way of thinking uh, can open your mind in terms of how you'd like to phrase um, a software management plan uh, for your software going forward. Any questions at this stage? Yes, Shweb, we have a couple here. So the contribution to research of a new piece of software would require the comparison with existing software. Should the state-of-the-art report be part of an SMP? And how would you find out about assessing existing research software for your use case? So in terms of, um, in terms of the first part of the question, which was about where to put um, state-of-the-art, um, I think state of the art should probably be referred to often state or state of the art is needed when you're doing proposals. So I think the SMP should just refer to the state refer to the state of the art. In terms of assessing software um, for that you'd like to take on board and like to use, the interesting thing is with the online software evaluation, uh, looking at the um, we don't exist in a situation where people do software projects and say, oh, we've been evaluated, click here to see our evaluation report. That would be a great place to, um, that would be a great situation. But using these sorts of tools and techniques, um, one can uh, evaluate pieces of software, especially maybe an online uh, evaluation and go through and say, okay, well, do they have a readme? Do they have a license file? Um, can I build a software? Can I get it up and running? When's the last commit? Oh, it was three years ago. I think this software might be dead. So like, is there a contact email address before taking on um, a piece of research software that you might want to use? Or if you're confident enough, you might decide the software does something great. There was a gap. I will take the software on board and um, I will develop and extend it myself because you might, you may well have um, the relevant skills. So uh, another question, Shweb. Typically, who should do the software evaluation other than the project lead? Some software developers treat their products like children <laughs> and can be resistant to criticism. Sure. Um, I mean, one of the ways to do it is to, I mean, if you don't have anyone to do it, then obviously the project itself will have to, will, will, should, it should evaluate itself. I mean, evaluating yourself is, is generally seen as not the best, not the best thing. There are um, certainly in the in the UK there's um, there's the, the growing notion of the research software engineer, which who are who are people with, often with a research background who are focused on helping researchers build better software. Um, I think 20 out of the 150 or so research universities in the UK um, have research software engineering. Um, outfits, um, and they they they're in a good position to um, do software evaluations for uh, for researchers, uh, or certainly to help them go about um, running one. I mean, ultimately, if you want to, uh, if people are averse to criticism, they 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 by run by running by getting somebody else, a colleague another group where you say, okay, we'll evaluate your software, can you evaluate ours? Um, it's ultimately going to help uh, it help, uh, help you. Uh, I mean, without wanting to extend the answer too much, ultimately if people 
do these things for the sake of the work and for the sake of getting the best results of the work rather than ego and not take it personally, then that's the right mindset to go into these things with. Okay, thanks. That's all for, for now. Okay. So a modern example of a, a research a management plan rather than the, the older ones that I showed um, is Laurent Gatto. He's a, an open science advocate and a group leader at the Duve Institute in Belgium, formerly from uh, University of Cambridge. And he highlighted in his blog here the difference between data management plans and software management plans. Uh, and also is an advocate for the fact that there's a proliferation of plans that people are suggesting uh, and the need for one kind of plan that has all this information in, which uh, is the output management plan. So here you can see he's comparing data with software in terms of data being static, software being dynamic, data being described in metadata, software via documentation, data tends to be larger. He, he deals with the genomic data, but they're you know, uh, and um, software tends to be smaller in comparison. Data has quality control, software is testing, DMP, SMP, data is in a database or public repo, and software is more uh, version controlled. So Lauren took the bold step of uh, publishing one of his um, data management plans uh, in uh, the research ideas and outcomes journal. Uh, so this is an example here that he provided from a funded project. Um, and it's an output management plan. Even though they asked for a data management plan, he, he combines uh, software data and materials. So he talks here about dissemination, how he's, he's very focused on R, and how he will uh, um, uh, analysis for genomics information, and how he will uh, using Bioconductor, he talked about the release schedule, talked about development platforms, being GitHub, talked about licensing, documentation, talked about reproducibility framework. So not all the things were nailed down. It wasn't perfect. Remember at the beginning I said it's an intention around how you will go about doing things. But it's a strong intention. And again, it's a living document or, or should be. Here's a, a private example. Um, so, like I mentioned before, uh, software management plans are part of grant proposals, usually in the UK part of pathways to impact. So they're not public. Uh, ideally, though, ideally there would be a repository of good ones. You know, even if it was redacted, to, you know, say, so that people could get the gist of how people were doing things. Because the software management plans, it, it talks about the right way of doing things. It's not about novelty. Uh, it's not about you know you it. it it talk, it's literally that you're doing things, you're managing your software in what in a way which is considered good, rather than you're doing something new which somebody else could could pinch, as it were, could take away, you know, uh, beat you to some beat you to something. So in this particular uh, software management plan, um, it featured quite uh, things to do with the the training and hack days to allow people to bring in and uh, do extensions documentation from the various uh, aspects of users and developers and deployers, how they were going to use GitHub issues and, and the wiki for documentation, and continuous integration, unit testing, uh, and uh, examples. They were going to document examples of how people had extended the system, because this was, a, this is a, I believe this was a library system um, that other people were building upon, not uh, a library that people were building upon. And you can see a, 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 a diagram blown out of the, uh, the different users or stakeholders, as it were. There have been criticisms of software management plans um, that are in the public. It sounds like a proposal. It's not specific enough. Basic information is missing. Size and type of data is missing, program language use is missing, necessary infrastructure is missing, exact licenses, what are they, what's your preservation duration, who are the people responsible, it's easy to read but useless to me, ouch. It's about principle but it's not machine actionable. If this is a draft of the planning phase, it's okay, but we want a living document. Um, the more advanced the research, the more information is needed. 
Okay, so this is uh, some of the, the comments I've highlighted in blue, size and type of data, program language, infrastructure, licenses. The, this, is, this information is useful, you know, in terms of constructive criticism, you know, we would, I think the, the information, this sort of information should be available. There might be situations in which that information is not available uh, at the start of a project. Some of the, and maybe also this is about the draft uh, of the planning phase, it's okay, but we want a living document. Perhaps that should have been highlighted blue as well. But some of these are, you know, some of these are quite um, vitriolic, uh, and it's a wonder that only the brave would share their data management and software plans, uh, management plans with comments like these. Um, so I believe really that perfection is the enemy of the good or the good enough here, and it, this, you know, imposter syndrome, thinking you can't, you know, you know, you don't have everything, you don't know how to do everything perfectly, or, or trolls, such as some of these comments were very indicative of the troll mindset, it shouldn't stop you from trying to adopt and improve um, your, your practices. In terms of a more constructive approach here, you know, and which is equally applicable to data management plans, you know, yes, software management plans are self-regulated, and this is a good thing. Right? Otherwise, potentially, it could be overbearing. However, you know, maybe for useful projects which are contracts, either in the EU, uh, the H2020 projects are considered contracts. You know, you said you were going to do uh, hit certain milestones, you're going to do produce certain deliverables, you had certain people charging a particular rate, uh, this is how it's going to work, and this is very much a contract rather than an intention. So perhaps for reviewers, a valid thing to ask at review is how are you keeping your SMP stroke DMP up to date? Are you evaluating that you're following your SMP and DMP? And you don't even have to use those phrases, SMP and DMP. You could use how are you keeping your, uh, how are you keeping up to date, how are you managing your software and data, how are you evaluate, evaluating your management of your software and data. Okay, any questions? Um, let me check. Here. No, we were good. Okay, okay. Okay. So, looking at it from a funder's perspective, one of the funders in the, well, based, they're based in the UK, but they, um, and they're focused on is Welcome, the Welcome Trust, um, and they, they exist to improve health by helping great ideas to thrive. And they're a politically and financially independent foundation that hopes to spend five billion over the next five years. So in 2018, they were the fourth wealthiest charitable foundation in the world. So no, by, by no means a small, uh, by no means small. So they've um, had some very forward-thinking um, policy guidance in the area of uh, output management plans. So uh, for them, um, output management plans would include data and software, would include research materials, for example, for lab-based experiments. Uh, we we'll talk about intellectual property and um, how that would be assigned and, uh, and perhaps even how that might be exploited. And, and also the resources required for the above, which perhaps is going um, uh, in terms of if there are repositories or other resources um, that are required to, to achieve those results. Um, you can see they're quite focused on different aspects of health uh, and biology, and genomics and clinical trials and computational modeling. Looking at the NIH, the National Institute for Health, who from 2003 have really um, required um, aspects similar to data management plans by, by data sharing. But software management has also been mentioned in some, in some of the plans. Uh, for example, in 2013, um, this, these are examples all from 2013, uh, from Library of Integrated Network-Based Cellular Signatures, and uh, you know, are the data and sharing, uh, are the data and software management and sharing plans adequate to make these resources available within the Linux Consortium to the larger research community? And also the de development of, of knowledge management centers for illuminating the druggable genome and centers of excellence for big data computing. Uh, and the biomedical sciences use this wording as appropriate applicants also uh, describe 
data and software management and provenance, uh, software development and testing practices, software toolkit development and deployment, application programming interfaces, and human subject data privacy and security protection. So quite wide ranging in terms of data privacy and software um, aspects were required. If you look at earlier, if they look at the documents from 2003 and some 2006 and 2004, they don't really mention software um, directly. Uh, some are mentioned in, in passing, for example, in the frequently asked questions here. Sharing of material, data, and software in a timely manner has been an essential element in the rapid progress that has, made, that has been made in the genetics of mammalian genomes. When making an application, um, you have to fill in this research plan form, um, and they have resource sharing uh, uh, plan as well. But they, there's a lot of mention of data. There's no default mention of, of software. Um, there is, uh, not mentioned on the slides here, but there is some aspect of uh, data science policy from into the NIH, where I believe there's a more of an emphasis on, on uh, software. It's very much, that's very quite, that's quite new. So this information from the NIH has led to the situation where for example, the um, Iowa State University has made this statement uh, in terms of the, its uh, um, institutional support pages for their researchers. Software is not re regarded as data, but it's recognized that access to software and other tools may be necessary to access and interpret that data. They, they may need to be covered in your plan, so nothing very firm. So still, influx, some good signs, but um, uh, something to be built upon. Institutional perspectives, this is just a smattering really uh, in terms of data management plans, UCL, Cambridge, Stanford, many other institutions have um, uh, subsumed um, the guidance for um, writing data management plans as their overall data management, research data management offerings often run through their library services. So these are quite catered for and quite professional. Some organizations, um, like TU Delft in the Netherlands, they have uh, a set of data stewards that help um, specifically with um, data management uh, around um, research data. In terms of software management plans, it's um, earlier days. Uh, Bristol wrote um, a page under the data management plan about writing a software management plan, and they have a point here about commercialization. Uh, they've injected this here, so this is a good point to catch and to help people to think about whether they want to exploit the, um, the software that they produce. Um, York here mainly talks about data management plans again, uh, mentions the SS SSI SMP template on DMP Online, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, and uh, software management plans sometimes in the context of software preservation and STFC. Uh, which is a UK funder, but also runs facilities as um, uh, a system here where, where they provide infrastructure for supporting actions, easy deposition of actions of data management plans or software management plans. So there is an increase in, in institutional support for software management plans, but this by no means, uh, <laughs> you can't tell by the amount of text here uh, given to each side, but um, it's more often coming for software management plans. So in terms of advocacy for software management plans, um, there was an article here on making software a first class citizen in research and a workshop on sustainable software scientific. Sorry. <laughs> it's about practices and experiences around, um, around sustainable software and science. Uh, and it was a satellite workshop run from the eScience 2018 conference in Amsterdam. And it talked about the recognition of the need for use of software it's lagging behind research data, and there needs to be a culture change around software credit. It also applies to data. Uh, and there were some recommendations um, that it pointed to in terms of best practice um, guidance, uh, in terms of you know making source, for example, the four OSS recommendations, making software available from in an open repository, telling people how they can contribute, uh, giving a, a specific license. Um, clear about documentation and citation. 
Uh, and there's other more detailed documentation there as well. It's also interesting to talk, I think I've hinted about, about the type of support institutionally. Research data management functions in libraries have looked after research data. I've not talked much about the research software engineers, but research software engineers is a type of unionization of people who write, do a lot of the research, uh, software work in research, um, and then mature into individuals who are mainly writing the software rather than doing the research. And there are some centralized functions of research software engineers and a research software engineer conference in the in September in the UK. There's also been one in Germany. There's also one in um, um, the Netherlands and further afield. And these would be a great people to actually help with development of software and, uh, management plans. There's also the idea of FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, uh, reusable. So FAIR data is quite well understood. FAIR software is more a, a nascent area, like what do these notions of fairness mean for software? And is, is, it, um, you know, is it enough? Openness as well, in terms of open data. Open source, is that enough? Or is it more a case of research took from open source, but there are other things that are needed for research software. There is a whole open science movement also, uh, in terms of all aspects of uh, openness. OK, in terms of um, tooling for SMPs, so there's a, a GitHub repository here, which is run by the Software Sustainability Institute. and um, this was used to help generate the report that you see in Zenodo. Um, so there's a single YAML file here, which is uh, a single source of truth, as it were. It has the questions and full guidance. And there's the Python script, which helps produce the, either the full guidance document or to produce a checklist. Initially, it was used to uh, create the version one doc star in Zenodo. But its intended uses are to be adapted by service providers. Uh, or adapted by institutions, funders, domains to include information which is specific to them and when they want different views on that information. Possible extensions, push templates to Google Docs or create GitHub issues or push the service providers via their APIs. Uh, this is a repository which people can comment on um, and uh, um, add. Um, feel free to, you know, uh, to, to and do pull requests. Okay, tools for making uh, data management plans, software management plans. So the UK main site for making data management plans, which um, institutions send to point to for research uh, projects, is DMP Online. And uh, software management plan template has been available on there since 2015. Um, so they do support software management plans also. Uh, and um, the template kind of takes you through different facets, the different these different questions to help you uh, answer those questions for your for any particular call. But the US main site for data management plans is the MP tool. It doesn't serve a software management plan specifically at the moment. I wanted to raise this issue of uh, kind of golden examples. Uh, I mentioned that software management plans at the moment just exist in pathways to impact documents in um, uh, the UK anyway. Uh, although there was the example of someone making theirs, uh, Lauren, Lauren Gatto making his available online. So they're kind of few and far between, and so they're, they're hard to get to. But good examples do exist for research data, for data man management plans, and they might be useful to, 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 uh, to use, to refer to by analogy. So the LIVA, uh, which is a library organization, has a DMP catalog, useful in this case. And here's the Zenodo link for that. Um, they have eight examples from various disciplines, and they've got reviews and highlights. And they're quite, they're quite fully fledged. Um, and so in terms of um, looking at information which might be useful as analogy for research software and looking at the facets and looking at the depth, um, they would certainly be interesting use cases. Um, Use, case, use examples to look at. The future, well, there's a whole issue. This doesn't affect just uh, data software management plans, but this also affects um, data management plan. Sorry, software management plans and data management plans is the area of machine actionability. 
envisage the world in which everyone's writing software management plans or data management plans or output management plans. Everyone's using a different style. Everyone's doing, using a different format. So it becomes really, really difficult to check unless you're going to go through manually whether people are doing what they say, even if even if only for some of the things that they're saying, are they, do they have the documentation? Is there a read me? Are there tests? You know, is the repository open, et cetera, et cetera. And that's for software, um, as an example. But so machine actionability is the software management and plans and data management plans themselves being executable in some way so that you could actually run them to see if they're doing what they say. I mean, this is this is really the, the future, a um, uh, future idea for uh, how this area will mature and become more manageable so people can make judgments across um, uh, across an area of how well software and data management plans are doing. Again, there might be situations that this might not be possible, but this is certainly, machine actionability is certainly a push um, uh, in, in this area. Okay, in terms of uh, kind of then take home messages, uh, data management plans are the most common type of plan. Software management plans have started to become more common, stroke mandated. They are moved to have combined plans in the form of output management plans, which we at the Institute believe is a great thing. As with all changes in this area, there's an interplay between funders, institutions, tool guidance providers, and researchers. And there needs to be, you know, we need to carry on the pressure really for sustained, sustained culture change to move towards software management plans and output management plans. And again, some things are better than nothing. There is a fear that you need it needs to be perfect, but you know, don't fear the trolls. And SMP should be living documents. So you need to think about not just a checkbox exercise, done it, it's gone, but how are you how are you abiding by it and does it need to be changed? And software evaluation can really help keep software management plans fresh. Are you doing what you said you would be doing? Or they can even help uh, bootstrap them. Um People can feel free to comment or request on the SSI SMP guidance at the GitHub project. And there is a need for an open repository of software management plans to help the community to formulate their own. Uh, due to privacy permission issues, it doesn't exist at the moment compared to data management plans. And one has to think about the primary benefit of this. Right? The primary benefit of this is not for others, it's for yourself. You know, Will you be able to reuse your software Will you be able to deal with um, a change in institution? Will you be able to deal with a gap in your software? Will you be able to deal with one PhD student going and another PhD student coming? Will you be able to deal with a publisher saying, okay, well, how do, as, as things change in the publishing world and people are getting more, more kind of uh, credit for reproducibility or mandating reproducibility, will you be able to give them the software that used that uh, that you use to produce particular tables and uh, graphs uh, and analysis. Okay, I'd just like to have some acknowledgements. Uh, Mike Jackson is a consultant at the EP, uh, Edinburgh Primal Computing Centre. Like to thank him. He did the, the work on the uh, the, uh, the the guidance. Uh, Neil Chu Hong is the director of the institute. He um, had some uh, some of the initial ideas and very much involved in the conversations around uh, software management plans and pushing, helping uh, take the case to funders. Uh, Sarah Jones, Associate Director of Digital Curation Centre, who is really helpful in giving uh, the background and updates on what's happening in the data management world. Jackie Mopro, who um, looks after software management plans from the SSI with himself, and Martin Ribeiro, who was a former staff at Digital Curation Centre, who helped bring software management plans um, into the DMP online tool, as well as our funders um, and supporters. Okay. To uh, any questions? Yes, yeah, Shweb, we have one here. You mentioned on this slide seven uh, to, to talk about the SMP measuring how how helpful the re the research software is. What are typical metrics for doing this? There is some discussion in question two, if it's one of the previous questions that we had. There's some discussion in question two above about citation count, but what are other good measures of helpfulness and the impact? So, um, so basically, 
In slide seven, I was I was covering an overview of um, of the type of questions that were being asked. Um, slide eight, sorry, slide nine through ten went through the actual questions, and really the point I was making was that um, to assess how you're doing, you really need to do software evaluation. Are you doing what you you're saying you're doing on the plan? Did that answer the question, or was, I might have been a bit that I missed? Um, I think so, unless the person who asked the question, let me see here. Okay, so uh, just uh, the person is typing, just <laughs> bear with me here. So the participant is typing. So. Um, the question was more about how do you, how to decide the importance and the impact of the software you are making or evaluating. Okay, so in the first instance, you, the first instance you decide how important it is for yourself. You know, is it is it gonna is writing the software going to allow you to do things that you wouldn't have done before? Is it going to allow you to do things with more or more information than? Uh, than it did before is it allow you going to model a larger system than it did before so really it's about looking at it from your own perspective i mean if you're looking at it from an external perspective evaluating somebody else's software then again it's about unless you're particularly skilled it's again it's about yourself you know how will, do i want to use the software what are my specific problems Um, I don't see any other questions uh, here, Shoaib. Um, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. It's, um, 